I think we're ready to get started. So welcome to our topic, uh, which is um, early stage, you aren't too small to think about user rights. Um, so you're a startup and trying to figure out this stuff. Um, my name is Nick Grossman. Uh, I work at Union Square Ventures. This is Jamie Tomasello, works at Cloudflare. We're going to do more introductions in a second. This is Dave, and I don't remember your last name. Engberg, uh, the CTO of Evernote. Um, first, we wanted to know uh, who in the room, who are you guys? Who are um, from startups? Ish? Companies? Ish. Ish? Uh, lawyers? <laughs> What are other categories that we're interested in? Activists. <laughs> Activists? Nice. That's a good category. Um, that's really interesting. More lawyers and more activists than I was expecting. Mm -hmm. um, that's fascinating. Um, the lawyers, who do you work for? Do you work for startups? We want to work for startups. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Okay, so do you work for big companies? Or do you work for other? Advocacy organizations. Great. Private law firm. Okay. So, so it makes. We can also maybe uh, tailor that a little bit because I think we've been thinking that we'd be speaking to people from startups, about startups, um, but we can also talk about how uh, folks who are outside of companies work with companies to help them figure stuff out to some extent. Um, okay, so first we'll do some quick introductions. Uh, my name is Nick. I work at Union Square Ventures. <coughs> We're a uh, venture capital firm based in New York City. Uh, investors in a lot of social and collaborative platforms like Twitter, Tumblr, Kickstarter, Etsy, um, peer-to-peer networks. Um, and I focus on public policy and regulatory issues that affect our companies and the broader internet. I work with all of our companies. I work with a lot of activists and uh, academics and, and folks working in DC and different countries on, on a whole range of policy issues. Um, and the reason that I'm here, and the reason that we care about this topic um, is that we often get asked, why do investors have an interest in, uh, in user rights above other things that they might have an interest in in a, in a company, and um, for, for instance, profits? Um, and the answer for us is that uh, you know, as more and more uh, people become members in internet communities, um, and develop a better and better understanding of the rights and uh, that, that they have and the sort of relationship they have with those platforms. And the more people start to think about their relationship with their data um, and their speech and how the various platforms we interact with mediate that, um, we believe that uh, it's going to be more and more and more and more and more important for uh, any company on the internet to develop po uh, policies that are pro-user um, and sort of respect users' rights and, and develop a, a positive trusted relationship. So it's a, and, and that the companies that do that uh, will ultimately create a more sustainable uh, business in the long run. Um, so that's our perspective, and that's me. Hi, I'm Jamie Tomasello. I lead policy and investigation at Cloudflare. It's a strange title, there's no proper noun in it, it's okay. Um, Policy and investigation is an interesting role in our organization because uh, it's one that requires many hats. Uh, so it encompasses your traditional trust and safety or inbound abuse complaints, those types of issues, um, law enforcement liaison work, um, subpoena compliance, PCI compliance, privacy issues, uh, incident response. So I oversee all of those types of the, those types of issues. So anything that could be related to trust and or safety. And the reason why I think this is important is because um, it's not a question of when you're going to have an issue or when law enforcement is going to arrive. It's a matter of if, and you need to be prepared. Um, a lot of startups these days um, are launching products that go global very quickly. And people forget, oh my goodness, this data in other countries that we're collecting um, has different types of regulation than it does in the United States. Or, oh wow, we have a bunch of this data that has value to a black market, or it has value in uh, certain types of um, criminal uh, ways. Um, either it's you've got user data that could be used, the user thinks that passwords are compromised, um, that could be used against other sites, or um, you have a platform that could be used to facilitate other types of 
criminal behavior, not because you designed it that way, um, but because it just happens to facilitate that type of user-generated content or that type of discussion, um, and then it may be of interest for law enforcement, um, either from a strictly from receiving legal process or um, from either a wiretap or a pen register trap and um, trace type scenario. So yeah, it's definitely about being prepared for the inevitable. And before we move on, uh, I don't know if everybody knows what Cloudflare is. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, Cloudflare is a website optimization company and uh, we provide uh, security services to prevent distributed denial of service attacks. So essentially we provide CDN services and DDoS prevention uh, services. And a tremendous amount of internet traffic flows both ways through Cloudflare to content sites and back to users. That's correct. We are not a hosting provider, so we sit in the in the middle in the network, uh, a network service uh, solution provider. Um, we currently are seeing about 5% of the internet and measured through by page views. So it's a considerable amount of internet traffic. We have over um, it's one, actually we're over two million um, websites that are through Cloudflare. I'm Dave uh, Ingrid, CTO at Evernote. Um, I'm, I think I'm the token engineer in the room, so please be gentle. Um, uh, Evernote is uh, a service for helping you remember anything you want. Um, I think part of the reason I'm here is that Evernote is is in the minority of uh, internet companies right now that is a product that is built with privacy first. Uh, when we were getting funding in 2007, uh, it was next to impossible to get any money for anything that wasn't focused on like another way to brag about your dog or your kids or what you have for dinner. Um, you know, we were uh, a, a, the anti-social network building something that was just for the 90% of your life where you, you weren't blogging about stuff. Um, I think from my perspective, uh, uh, not everyone needs to go that route, but it is a legitimate option. And I think the most important thing that we've learned is that uh, being transparent with your customers, with your users, uh, which aren't all, always the same thing, uh, about what you will be doing with their data and what you will be doing, uh, what their rights are, uh, is, is extremely valuable. Uh, we have tried to do that from the very beginning. Uh, and, and the trust we've built up with our users over time has a lot of value. It doesn't have to be a conflict. It doesn't have to be uh, you know, respecting users' privacy and being transparent and honest about what you are doing with user data does not necessarily have to decrease the value of your company. You can, you can become a uh, successful large company that, while still uh, selling uh, transparency and user privacy as part of your offering. Um, so I'm actually encouraged that there's so many lawyers in the room uh, and, and activists also because I was talking to Jake earlier, that's Jake, uh, about how, man, this is such an exciting time to be uh, someone specializing in information law. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine a better field and a place where there are more uh, interesting jobs to be found. And one of the observations that I had as we were talking this morning was that um, no matter what kind of company you are, like Cloudflare is a proxy that that shitloads of internet traffic flow through, or if you're Evernote in a, a sort of a private place for people, or if you're a social site like Twitter, or if you're a marketplace like Etsy or a crowdfunding site like Twitter, uh, there are innumerable issues uh, around user rights and privacy and censorship and shaping speech um, that are that run the gamut from being very straightforward, and even the ones that are very straightforward are probably not that straightforward, to being very complex. Um, and so we were hoping to structure the conversation today um, just by walking through uh, a bunch of the issues that tend to be faced by uh, internet startups as they grow, um, ranging, and, and we wanted to start with the sort of more straightforward issues around security and, and dealing with law enforcement, um, and then move into some of the more complicated issues about uh, sort of shaping speech and, uh, you know, uh, certain kinds of privacy and, and so on. Um, and so this is a small room. I would encourage you guys to interrupt and ask questions. Absolutely. Um, between, you know, I'm just a, a guy who happens to work with a lot of guys who know things, but these guys actually know a lot of things. Um, so with that, where should we start? 
Well, what do you guys want to hear? We have, obviously we have things we want to talk about. Are there any hot issues that you guys want to hear about since we're giving you guys the opportunity to make this interactive and, and make it conversational? All right. And please introduce yourself. If yeah. you're comfortable. Uh, Jake Brewer, I'm the I run external affairs for change.org. Um, so our platform is kind of like inherently built for users to challenge power, which is awesome. Uh, also presents all kinds of challenges. One of the things that we've had a lot of issues with is just court-ordered user uh, data sharing. And when we actually would comply, then when we actually fight it, and then to the point that like, fighting it too much would mean, you know, could mean essentially killing our company. It's not going to make that much money. Um, so we're kind of in that weird stage of being big enough to sue as a, like a big-ish startup, but a very small company. And so this is just a lot, it's a very risky area for us, but it's happening more and more. So from that perspective of dealing with court orders, I mean, it, there's that challenge, right? Um, there's a certain amount of how much do you have faith in the legal process? I mean, from, from our perspective, I mean, some of you laugh, but I mean, that it's, it comes up, right? Whether or not that the, there's the technical perspective of is this legal process the, the function of this legal process correct, right? Did they give us um, a subpoena that was dated properly, that had, you know, that it was signed appropriately, that, the, that we, and all of the, the technical aspects, was this all correct, was this issued out of the right court, so on and so forth. And then there's the content aspect. What are they, if, is what they're asking for inappropriate? Is that something that you're willing to fight? A lot of people fight sort of on the technicality, um, or that it's overly broad, or, you know, something of that nature. Um, at Cloudflare, we have very clear policies on how we deal with legal process. Um, if we receive any legal process, be it a subpoena, a court, or what have you, uh, we intend to give notice to our customer before disclosure of content of, the, of what they're requesting, um, unless ordered not to do so by the court. How do you, yeah. Right, so, so like a 2705B order? Right. right. So in that, <laughs> in that case, functionally, yeah. we don't have, you know, it's one of those things where we don't have an issue with law enforcement, right? It is not our role to either impede law enforcement or overly assist law enforcement. They have, they have a job that we respect and, you know, we appreciate the assistance that they provide our customers and, you know, we understand what they do. Um, we don't have an issue with the function of law from the perspective of, you know, court orders have due process and there's judicial review. So all, you know, all from that perspective, if we feel that they're overstepping their bounds, or that it's an in a, based on the information that we have, I mean, it's information or belief that this is a fishing expedition, or that it's what they're asking for is inappropriate, then that's something that we would consider to fight. Uh, we've made it very clear that if we re received requests, actually in our most recently published transparency report at cloudflare.com slash transparency, um, we, we've, a little plug for our transparency report, um, but we, we've made some I never statements, right? Um, Cloudflare has never released our SSL keys or our customers' SSL keys to law enforcement or any third party request. You know, we have never, um, we have never given out, you know, user credentials, things like that. Um, and those are the types of, and we've made it really clear those are the things that we're going to fight. We're going to fight any sort of legal process that does not have judicial review or due process involved. We made that very clear. Um, but besides that, from a court order perspective, there's a certain amount where you, you have, unless it meets those standards that you decide in your own company. And you have to be really consistent with those policies. You can't be like, oh, well, in this case we're not gonna do it, but this case we'll fight it. Um, you respond. We respond, right? We're appropriate. So you, you talk about the tension with technicalities. I guess that's that's one of the things that we've had trouble with. That if we get a subpoena, that's the language of what they're asking for. Like I know I could interpret it in the way that they maybe intended and satisfy it. Versus, uh, you know, the, they talk about use language like email when we aren't an email provider because they have some boilerplate. Like what do you, what do you do in that case where like it's pretty obvious like what they intended. Like is it is it appropriate to basically be jerks about it and just push back and push back on like, nope, don't have that, don't have any email. Yeah, it is. I mean, it, it technically is appropriate for you to do it. It depends on your, your, your company's perspective, right? If you're looking for a way to push back on legal process, then you can push back on the technicalities and go, no, you specifically asked for an email account 
we don't have email. You know, you respond to, uh, and I, I, sorry, I should start this with this disclaimer. I am not a lawyer. I do not play one on TV. I am not your lawyer. So obviously you need to run this all by your own counsel. But from our perspective, you know, we've seen two different things that companies do. They either say there's technicalities and so you don't respond with certain pieces of information uh, because a lot of law enforcement aren't educated um, on your technology or on other people's technology. Um, and so they will send you that traditional ISP telco subpoena attachment, right? Where they ask for like call records. Um, or you can choose to educate law enforcement and try to build a relationship of trust and set appropriate boundaries and say, look, we know that you guys have a job to do. We respect the government. You know, we're not, Cloudflare is not, you know, we're not an anarchist organization. We believe that government has a purpose. And, you know, try to make your government better by getting out there and voting the right people in. Um, but these pieces of process are, are appropriate with, with due process and judicial review. And so, from our, from our perspective, so when we receive a subpoena or we receive a court order with an inappropriate attachment, you know, instead of completely pushing back and saying, okay, we're not gonna respond at all, we do use that as an opportunity to educate. To educate those people in law enforcement to say, look, what you are asking for is not appropriate. What you need to do is narrow the scope of your attachment. What you need to do is have an understanding of the technology, what we do, because we're not going to give you what you've asked for. What, what do you need to conduct your investigation, not what do you want? Um, one of the things that we do is we provide education to law enforcement, um, to the FBI on cloud service providers. Like, this is what the technology means. Do not issue a warrant for this server in a shared hosting environment. Right? Because this is not going, sure, this may help you in the sense that maybe that content that you're looking for is there, but you did just take something out of service. Like, you don't do that. What do you actually need? Don't send me a subpoena requesting abuse complaints and support tickets. Do you really need that content? I highly doubt you need that content. And I'm going to push back on it, and I'm going to ask for a warrant for anything that has any content-related request. Um, but in general, you know, we use it as an opportunity to educate law enforcement. Um, and it's actually paid off really well because we've gotten better, more narrowed scope process going forward. Um, and we've actually heard from other folks that said, you know, because you guys were consistent with the application of your policy and you educated us on the need for a court order, it didn't surprise me the next time when I went to a different service provider and they asked me for a 2705 <coughs> order. And I knew what I was supposed to do. So it, it helps. Um, so you guys, uh, so uh, Cloudflare is now 80 employees serving a, a large amount of internet traffic. Uh, Evernote is 350 employees. You've been there since day one. Uh, you've been there since it was maybe 35 employees. Um, it, we've spent a lot of time within the USB portfolio talking with small companies about how, how do you even get started on this stuff when you've never dealt with any of these situations before? Um, how do you develop sort of a, a philosophy towards these things and you know how do you start to get prepared and how have you guys seen you know your approach to that uh, formed uh, especially during the early days so we, we were building Evernote in 2007 um, uh, we knew from the start certain things that we wanted to do to make sure that we would provide a, a, a baseline for user privacy a lot of that is internal controls you want to make sure that a minimum number of people have access to user data you want to uh, have auditing on everything they do from day one, etc. Uh, a lot of that sort of on the technical side, but on the on the philosophical side, uh, we also knew like we had to decide what like what our promises were to our users, and and that's something that like when you're just building the neat stuff, it's it's hard to stop and think about what what are the implicit and explicit promises to the users. Um, it took us a while to actually write those down, and we we, we summarized them. Uh, our CEO posted uh, officially on our blog in 2011 that uh, we have three laws, uh, kind of office to call them laws, I think my hypotheses, but the law, law number one was uh, your data is yours. Um, our philosophy is we are, we are custodians of your information. Um, we do not own your data, therefore it's not ours to, to sell or resell or uh, monetize. We are, you are paying us to, to hold your data. Um, you, your data is, uh, uh, is protected. We will make 
our best effort to protect the integrity of that. The data is private by default. Uh, only if you go out of your way to explicitly share it with someone does it become public. And uh, the third law was your, your data is portable. Uh, we, from the very beginning, said that uh, we must make it possible for you to take all of your content out of Evernote at a moment's notice and, and take it somewhere else. So with either of our desktop applications, there's a menu item to say export and it will produce something in the most portable form that I could think of, you know, HTML documents interlinked with all the images and things like that so that you could dump out your 50,000 note, every other account and leave tomorrow if you wanted to. Um, that was important for us. Um, part of that was, it was important philosophically. Uh, the, the, the founders of our company uh, had left the Soviet Union during Soviet days and their, their attitude was that any, any country that you'd want to live in as a country that you could leave. And, and that's, that was sort of deep in our psyche. But from a business perspective, from a, from a cold calculating capitalist perspective, uh, that is very, very important to give people confidence that, that it is safe to invest their time and effort into, into what we're doing, uh, to, to make people feel like that uh, we weren't going to be able to pull the rug out from them from under them at, at, at some moment, or you know, realistically, this being Silicon Valley, like we weren't just going to run out of funding to be uh, selling off furniture the next day. We wanted to make sure that the people felt like putting hours and weeks and months of their life into our product uh, was was not a risk of their time, not a risk of, of their privacy. They could they could leave if they needed to. Um, I think a lot of companies don't really uh, have a chance to to reflect on what that relationship is with their users and I don't think it's I don't think it's one size fits all. There are going to be companies that, that they 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 tell you that they will take all your phone records and then send you a free pizza every month and that's not inherently immoral. Like if if that is a contract that you want to get into with a company, like that's that's okay as long as it's transparent, as long as like you know what you're getting into and you're getting free pizza and that's 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 the right trade-off for you. I don't think that that's that's wrong, but on the other hand, that, that needs to be obvious. That, that needs to be like explicit, and that's what they're selling, and, and that a, a rational person can evaluate the pros and cons of that. It's interesting that you bring that up, because we, we have a lot more children and teenagers and, and millennials, I guess. I feel so old when I say that, but uh, people who are growing up at an, an age where your identity has, they think has very low value. They don't understand the, the cost of trading their information about themselves um, for a service, for some free service. And, and you never, there's no such thing as a free lunch. I mean, everybody says that, but it's true. Um, you know, if you're providing your personal information, companies are going to use it for something. And there are laws out there to protect children under you know, the age of 13, but in general, you know, we've got a whole bunch of people who are growing up in an, in an atmosphere of, well, here, I'll just, give out um, my email address for this service, or here's some information about myself, or what school I went to, or sure, go ahead, go ahead and tag all my, these pictures with my face, or what have you. Um, and it's unfortunate, because I just don't think they can appreciate the value of their identity and the value of their privacy right now. And so we do have a certain amount of responsibility as custodians of data to not be big brother and say, okay, well, I'm going to tell you what you should and should not do with your data, but at least... That would be daddy, not big brother, <laughs> doing that. <laughs> I guess. I, I guess in that case. But um, but I think that there's a certain amount of responsibility of, that we are doing no harm, right? We're doing no evil with that data when we say that we're a custodian and, and try to be transparent and say, look, this is what we're doing. It's, we're being clear and conspicuous. Um, and, and just try to be better net citizens because people have fairly low expectations right now. Um, so. Well, so, okay, so there's this idea that as a young company, uh, you need to make a contract with your users, make it, have an understanding with your users about what deal they're getting into with you and sort of what role you're going to play. Um, but there's also, uh, in every startup, a whole lot of uncertainty about what you're going to be doing, <coughs> what you're going to make, and what you're going to do. Um, whether that's you know, mining the data for your internal analytics, or, um, you know, uh, using web traffic data to learn about, to, to protect against uh, certain kinds of attacks or other unforeseen possible innovations that could come from using the data that you're collecting in interesting ways. Um, how do you square uh, the need for a sort of a consistent voice with an, uh, sort of an openness to unforeseen 
innovations and opportunities. It's interesting you bring that up. Cloudflare initially was launched as a web security company, and in, in building out its infrastructure, it turned around one day and went, oh, we're a CDN. Um, because that's, in thinking from a security mindset, and, and the way that we built our infrastructure, we also created this ability to uh, provide website optimization, and, and we were, you know, we were a CDN. Um, and that sort of changed things, and it kind of changed our offerings. But we still try to keep the general vision the same. Um, and I think one of the key things to keep in mind as a startup, and for those of you who attended TrustyCon, this is not an original Jamie idea, um, I believe Marsha Hoffman said this during her presentation, but um, she said, you know, don't make promises that you can't keep or that you don't know that you can't keep, right? Um, and, and you want to try to be as transparent and, and notify your customers when things change and be respectful of that relationship and the data that you have. But, yeah, you can't make a promise that you don't know you can't keep. So how often does this sort of thing come up with the, the earlier stage companies that you meet with? Like, is it, you've got a 10-person organization, or they, is privacy one of the topics, or is that the 48th thing that the board member brings up after, you know, what's your monetization strategy, and how are you acquiring users, and blah, blah, blah? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on the company. Uh, so Cloudflare is a USB portfolio company, and uh, one of the reasons I think we've been so interested in Cloudflare as, uh, as a platform and as an investment is that they have these values very deeply baked into, into the platform. And so in that case, it was very, very high on the list of things that we uh, talked about. Um, in, uh, and in other, in other cases, it, it's just less so. So think about, and we can uh, think about like something like Kickstarter uh, or or Etsy, or even at the beginning, you know, Twitter, I don't think people thought a whole lot about privacy implications of, of Twitter data, but there are, there are lots and lots of them in terms of people's location and so on and so forth. So, so it really depends. Um, and um, I, I think we are really mindful of the balance between sort of privacy and opportunity, or sort of trust, and, and uh, creating trust while still leaving open the opportunity to, to, to Create interesting new things. Um, so, it, you know, it, it, some investments that's more front and center than others. Um, but it's, so I guess it depends. Well, I think the interesting thing also, if you're trying to enter a startup or a startup who's starting to encounter maybe some of these user uh, rights or privacy or trust issues, and you don't have full executive support. Um, one of the things that's been really helpful, and this is not at Cloudflare, but previous experiences and as well as talking with other startups, um, is making the case for what that brand reputation hit will cost if it comes out that you do not support your user rights, that you are not there as a trusted entity, and that, um, you, that privacy is not a main concern. Um, because when there's a breach, people are going to jump ship and go to the more secure and what they believe to be secure competitor, um, unless you come out and, and are very forthcoming to your to your base and say, you know what, we had this incident, something occurred, and, um, you know, we're trying to make it right. So, go ahead. Um, yeah, just to follow up, so how, how would or should a, a small company best communicate those, their values? I'm just wondering. Um, if you don't have a track record, if there aren't you know, news articles of you standing up for your users, um, when I'm looking at third party members, I'll just go to their legal terms, and often those are pretty unfriendly. I mean, they're not, they're not written to, be, you know, to communicate values. I think. So, how, what would you suggest? To, to... Yeah, I think the, the question of how do you, how do you talk to a vendor, like that's, that's, that's a fantastic one because I've been on both sides of the table with that. Uh, and um, typically, the a startup that is able to answer the questions by handing you a, a handing you a packet with the answers already done, like that, that is an indicator that, that they have a level of maturity. They actually thought about it. Um, if anyone who takes your questionnaire and is just sort of gradually filling in things one at a time, they haven't really thought about it. And a lot of that involves um, you know, the technical aspects, but but a lot of it is the policies and the internal controls and the auditing. Like those are the, those are the questions that you would be asking a vendor, and a company that that can't articulate that uh, upfront clearly with a 
structured, well-written, 30-page PDF is not is probably not really at a mature enough stage that I would I would trust them for anything important. I mean, obviously, if if, if, if it's a company that's just doing like a, a vendor that's just doing icons and they're you know, making bitmaps for you, like that, that doesn't really matter. But as soon as employee data and uh, uh, service data, user data especially, uh, starts touching a, a, a third party service, it becomes extremely important to get to that, that point. Um, uh, I've been at the table when we've brought in the first person like Jamie at Evernote. Uh, I, and someone mentioned that, that uh, you, you might be interested in someday being at a startup. I, I can tell you that the first day that someone shows up to be the privacy person at a startup, there's there's usually a <coughs> with some glazed eyes with the executives, and it tends not to be because you know they they don't care, but because the expectations of people from the outside about what you're spending all of your time on versus the expectations of what you're doing at a 40 person startup that really hopes you can make payroll in November. Uh, like the, the amount of, of, of hours that you're able to spend on uh, writing out the exact uh, workflow that you would go through if you get exactly this type of subpoena from the government uh, before you've ever had that subpoena before. It's, it's, it's just completely unrealistic that there would have been someone at, at, at a startup that was worrying about that at the same time that they're trying to get Apple to push the latest release out and they're trying to get the, the servers to stop uh, crashing and, and things like that. Um, so I, I think that in general, when, we, when, you, when, you, when you see a small company, you see a startup that, that uh, gets some bad press for not getting privacy right, not getting security right, um, there's always a, a lot of you know, snark of, oh my gosh, I can't believe they could possibly have gotten that wrong. Um, from my perspective, it almost feels like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that everyone doesn't get it wrong. It's, it's, it's hard because you have to get everything right to stop the bad guys. Um, uh, all it takes is, is screwing up on one thing to get it wrong. And um, the, the intense, the intention is, I've, I've found, usually good. It's just you don't have time or resources to really work on it. And you're looking for the right person to come in and, and, and help you get actionable stuff done fast. And you, and you often see uh, companies forming these policies after, in response to something that happened, right? So one of the ones we were discussing earlier was uh, there was a situation on, on Kickstarter where there was a, a project that got funded uh, where the, the author of the book had made, it was like a, a guide to getting laid or something like that. It was like a, a dude, like a bro thing. And the guy had made some sort of unsavory comments about women somewhere else and the project got backed. And uh, once that happened, people got really upset and uh, put the question to Kickstarter, um, what's our role in either supporting or not supporting this type of project, right? So that's like a very specific case that tests your sense of your role as a platform in, in moving things in a certain direction and sort of, you know, and having an agenda uh, in addition to sort of your basic responsibilities. And I think it's pretty hard to, and what they ended up doing was uh, issuing an apology, basically, that they hadn't, they, they felt like they should have pulled it, in, even though they didn't. It's very complicated, and that gets us to the complicated section of the conversation. Um, but the point I just wanted to make is that I think it makes a lot of sense to try and think about, as early as possible, what kind of company you are and what kind of questions are most likely to come up most immediately. Um, so in some cases, in the case of Evernote, it's, very obviously, you know, people's innermost thoughts are recorded here. So, like, security is a core issue. We should have a have sort of, we should go into this with a perspective on that. With, I think, a lot of the more nuanced things, it does make sense to have an incident, you know, trigger the, the conversation that, that gets you to the point where you need to start to go um, policies. And, you know, one of my favorite things about the internet is that we get to experiment, and one of my favorite things about companies is the way that watching them respond to crisis and there's this notion of the, the service recovery paradox where if a company fall, fails and then recovers gracefully you like them more than if they had never failed in the first place um, and so I think you see a lot of that uh, with these kinds of policies within yeah and to um, answer your question a little bit as well um, it, you do need to figure out what your company's values and mission um, missions are, but how do you communicate to that? How do you communicate that to your customers? I mean, it's leveraging, it, it's really how important is that? Is it so important that you need to start communicating that on day one if you guys know what your core values are? 
then yeah, you will. You will start communicating it through your blog post. You're going to communicate it through your PR, your social media, I mean, all of that. It just becomes, anytime there's a speaking engagement, anytime you guys are going to meet up, you talk about it because it's something that you're proud of. Like, you know what Mozilla is about, right? Because they evangelize at just in everything that they do. Um, you know, it's something that at Cloudflare we talk about a lot, how it's really important. Um, you know, Evernote talks about how this is a key part of their, their service, so you just, you make it part of your marketing, you just, it, it becomes part of your brand. Um, and so you just communicate it early and often. Uh, and if it changes, you communicate that as well, and just be honest, and um, you're, you're, you want your customers to be evangelists. They're more willing to forgive when you make a mistake, when you apologize. It's not about admitting fault, it's just about admitting responsibility, or acknowledging <coughs> responsibility. And we, we, Oh no, go ahead. There's a, there's a question. Go ahead. I was going to say, we, we, we posted, our CEO posted on our blog in 2011 exactly what our privacy values were, um, and he's you know, done interviews about that. I think that, that even if even if it wasn't in, like, something the company was doing early, it's, it's, it's never too late to really make it explicit. And when we ask users who are using Evernote for free, and then started paying us, what the reason that they started paying us was, the number one reason is just that they, they like the company and they want to support it, and I think that it, it is legitimate to establish that, that trust um, over a long period of time and, and have it turn into money. I mean, I, I, thanks for the remarks, I think this is an interesting panel, um, but I do want to push a little bit and ask you both, because you're talking about these issues in terms of marketing and communication, but fundamentally we're talking about human rights issues here, we're talking about people's legitimate rights. Um, so I wonder if perhaps the sector, and perhaps small companies and big companies in the sector, are getting a little bit of an easy pass, um, largely because perhaps user data isn't, and privacy isn't really the most tangential type of human rights harm um, that can be affected. Um, so, you know, the question then becomes, do you learn from mistakes that you're <laughs> suggesting, or is there a proactive agenda here where, where small companies who want to be evangel evangelical about these issues can band together and think about ways to push back, both at the government level, but also on this idea that like, we'll just iterate and eventually we'll get this right. I mean, a transparency report from, if you compare transparency reports, they all look totally different. There's no standardization. So the data, be data becomes somewhat hard to decipher or gather meaning from. So the question then is, are, we getting, are, we, are companies in this sector getting it kind of easy in terms of any other sector where there's potential human rights implications? And secondly, where is the innovation happening? Is it just about putting, in the panel before this, there was one transparency report that was showcased that had charts and flow charts and colors, and the big innovation was that they used, they packaged data in a different way. So, I mean, is there innovation that's protective of rights, or are we here innovating about marketing? I think, well, to go back to your point, are essentially our companies sort of banding together and, and sorting this out? Yes. Uh, I mean, even in that previous session, right, they were trying to come up with a standard way of reporting so that we were comparing apples to apples, right, and oranges to oranges. Um, so we, we see that happening. We see this push to get startups to be, to think about these issues because a lot of times it's easier to think about it from a user rights, from a privacy perspective than from a human rights perspective. Human rights is a very charged word or phrase, um, and so it's really hard sometimes if you just walk in and say to your CEO, hey, let's deal with human rights violations. Well, you know, that's a big deal. Um, but from a Cloudflare, so from a Cloudflare perspective, um, you know, there are situations where we have um, people using our services, websites that use Cloudflare services to protect their speech because they are under a constant DDoS. Um, or that they're constantly um, under attack in some way. And we get a lot of pressure from governments, from third parties that say, hey, you need to take down that site because we consider that to be terrorist speech. Um, and that was something where, you know, we had to sit down and say, okay, if somebody comes to us and, and foreign government, you know, um, US government doesn't matter and says, you know, you take this content down now because I said so, is that something we're gonna fight for? And we decided, yeah, that is something that we're gonna fight for. Um, you know, it, it, we have never, and this is one of our um, I never statements, but Cloudflare made the decision that we will never, and we have never, um, taken down a customer's website or moved the, affected their content or shaped their traffic because of a, a, because of a political speech issue. And that's something that, you know, I think there's room for that type of conversation of, all right, it, when you're dealing in especially user-generated content, 
that human rights issues do come up, but they're not going to be framed that way because, I mean, I hate to say it, I think human, that phrase human rights is very frightening to, to executive staff. Well, and I think that there's, there's things that, that, that might be right that aren't necessarily human rights. I mean, they, they, like our, 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 our insistence that you can export your data from our service, like the ability to get your paella recipes out of Evernote, like I, I'm, I'm proud that we have, I think it's the right thing to do, it's not human rights. I mean, like, this is not. So, I, I guess the, 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 the average startup doesn't really feel like most of what they're doing really touches on human rights per se, but I think that the, the, the thing that would really help for small companies, having gone through this a few times, the thing that would really help for small companies is, is some simple check, uh, checklists and boilerplates for privacy and security that they could follow without having to figure it out from whole cloth, and, and not have to take the entire universe of every single uh, security risk and every single privacy issue that could ever come up and solve them all, like I said, literally when you've got 10 people and you, you, you can barely make payroll for two more months, like like something that they could they could take and just sit down. And so I've done a, a couple talks lately trying to walk startups through security and like a, when you've got this many employees, you should be doing this, you should be doing this, you should be doing this, and realistically you're not going to get around to doing this. Like, and I think if there was something for for uh, privacy that would that would help that that. Uh, you know, some, some, some simple roadmaps, but that's not going to be a one-size-fits-all. I think that um, not every company is, 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 is going to have to have the same uh, constraints around what they do with, with data. I think um, uh, the, the right to be forgotten is, a, is an example that, that sort of hits home for us. Um, people spend uh, months putting together thousands of things that they want to remember for their life and ever know. And uh, the ability to go in and delete that casually with a single click of a button is kind of dangerous. Like that's dangerous for the end user because someone who gets into their account and, uh, just happens to know their password could do it trivially. Someone who, uh, who, uh, you know, it, 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 the, the number of people who say they want to close their account and then ask for the next day to reopen it, it's we, we spend probably two FTEs of, of support just remedying those situations. And I guess to me that one's not a black one black and white, I think the, the ability for a user to go through a process and choose to remove the information that they've put together in Evernote should be there, but the ability to make that trivial, the ability to make that super easy, I actually think that goes against the interest of, uh, of most of our users, so we have it be a multi-step process, and you have to select all the notes, you have to put them in the trash, you have to put them into the trash, and you go close your account. That's not because we want to retain users, that's because we want to pre pre prevent someone from accidentally doing something catastrophic to, to what they've put together. And I think that's, that's going to be a different balance for different companies. And I think there's also a sense of know your customer, right? If, and, and know your customer not from the sense of you need to have real ID, but you need to know the types of customers that use your platform. If you're a platform that is highly used by, by activists or by people whose rights are, can be infringed or that they're under attack or something like that, you also have to make sure that you prioritize features that cause them to be more secure. Make sure that they have the ability to use two-factor authentication. Make sure that you're communicating to them when there's you know, a phishing attack that's targeting Cloudflare customers. There are things like that where you need to make sure that you are protecting your customer because they are under attack. And being able to build things from a feature set um, to protect them because you know that they are that class where they are they are under threat. So I think one, and not to answer this question all day, but I, I think one one issue is like tools. Like startups are fueled on open source, and we've got lots of open source for web servers and data stores and so on. And and a, a lot of I, I would hope that at least some portion of this could get reduced to reasonable policy and reasonable tools to help implement it. And that's going to take a while, but I think that will be one thing. Then there's another set of issues that there's just not necessarily a clear answer to. It's like privacy, broadly, is just extraordinarily complicated and there's a lot of you know, situations that aren't really understood yet and we haven't formed sort of norms around. And then the last one is I think a lot of these relationships are still invisible. So one of the examples we were talking about earlier is uh, uh, Apple asked Tumblr to take uh, not safe for work gay content out of their mobile app. And uh, they did by, by filtering out a tag uh, and that, you know, is a very sort of complicated uh, situation where, you know, they're basically being put, you know, you know, forced into sort of a censorship role through, by way of a business relationship, 
um, and using um, some sometimes crude mechanisms to do it and maybe not communicating the right way around it. And I think a lot of companies are learning uh, learning hard lessons that way. Um, and oftentimes, just the, the, the dynamics at play are not visible yet. <laughs> For Cloudflare, we, we try to take a very neutral stance on things um, because it's, it's about providing the service. It's a, a network solution. Um, you know, it is not our role to be the arbiter of content. We're not policing the internet from that perspective. We are providing a way for customers to, to optimize the website and to prevent DDoS attacks. Um, that being said, you know, we get a lot of pressure from sometimes from our customers, sometimes from third-party anti-abuse entities that say, "Well, you've got, you know, you've got people who are using your service who do DDoS for hire." Now, that abuse does not come through our service. Um, but, you know, the traffic doesn't come through our service, but they, they say, okay, well, what about that? Why don't you take down, why don't you not serve them, or not allow them to use your services? Um, you know, why, why don't you take down this political speech site? Why don't you take down this hate site? Why don't you take down, you know, any, anything that um, could be viewed as, um, as bad, but it's important for us to be as objective as possible because we're providing a service that helps infrastructure. Um, and it, it becomes a very slippery slope when you start making subjective decisions um, where there's not proof of abuse of your actual service. Actually, uh, two different questions. I'm going to just throw them both out. One, in terms of a, a challenge for younger stage startup companies um, in dealing with third parties, um, whether they're using third parties to store data or deliver services, um, and not, I feel like they may or they may not have leverage over those third parties to enforce their own promises to their users and, and how companies can manage that uh, challenge. And the other, and, and Nick, I sort of would ask you, as really young stage companies who are thinking about needing capital, raising capital, um, is there, you know, are all investors sort of, you know, going to take the attitude that, that very user protective policies are a good thing? Um, or are they, you know, are investors going to push back and say you're actually limited? Um, what the possibilities are and, and how can companies navigate that? So I'll take the second one first. Uh, and uh, every investor is not the same, and every investor is in fact very different. And you know, the you want to be very careful picking who you work with and who's backing your company and what you know what their mindset is. So I can only speak for ourselves and, and tell you about the things that we think about and that we care about. Um, but but that's a that's a real issue for sure whether your company is private or public. And from a vendor perspective, you know, how do you apply pressure to third parties like that? Um, that's, a, that's a challenge when you're small, right? Because you're, you're not using market pressure. Um, and it's a lot of times the pressure as well. I only have X amount of dollars. I've got to use, I've got to use this VPS bin. Or I've got to use somebody in the cloud. I've got to use something. I don't have, I've got to stretch my money as far as I can. And it's about, I, I think one of the best, thing that you can do at, a, at an early stage is be able to evaluate your risk you know, and be able to say, okay, um, I'm doing as much diligence as I can on this company. There are some basic security controls that are out there and whether or not you grab some sort of due diligence spreadsheet you know, to send to them and say, hey, answer these questions for me. Do you have these basic security controls? Are you, you know, ISO 27000 series? Like, just ask those basic questions, but get a sense of what their controls are and and you know what their privacy policy is. I mean, if they've got control over your data or you're shipping user data off, but they're going to respond to law enforcement or give the information to third parties or monetize it, well, then you've broken your contract with your own customer. <coughs> Just being smart about that relationship, trying to find vendors that are like-minded, and sometimes you won't, um, but you've got to be able to say, okay, I've identified who they are, and when it's time to move, we'll move. Um, but yeah, it's difficult trying to at least establish, talk to them about their controls. You mentioned earlier uh, defects and subpoenas and overbroad requests for information, things like that. I'm just curious, how many times have you gotten completely paperless requests for information with a wink? I know Mozilla got a phone call from Homeland Security a while back asking for certain things to be done and it responded with a letter, and Homeland Security just went away. But it didn't stop Homeland Security from making the effort 
over the phone. And I was just wondering if, if this is something that you see on a regular basis or if it's rare. I and I don't mean just Homeland Security, but I mean yeah, yeah. any law enforcement agency. Um, do we get an informal request? Yes, we will receive an informal request where people will say, hey, you can, you know, can you provide me with this information about this domain? And I go, well, if you send me, this is our policy, you know, here's our subpoena, or uh, this is our subpoena process, this is our court order. And they go, okay, thanks, and come back with the process. Um, sometimes those conversations, let me rephrase, rarely have I had a conversation like that where it was malicious, where they were trying to get information without actually serving the process. Part of that may be because we're really, we talk about it a lot, like this is our policy, this is what we do, that we're very consistent about it. A lot of times, the conversations are folks that don't know what our policy is, and they just need a conversation of this is what the policy is, or um, they're just getting a heads up because they want to make sure that they're setting a, a tailored attachment. So we've never had a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, can you give us, an, can you give us information without us, can you give us inf customer information or billing information about <coughs> subpoena? I have not had that type of request. But I'm also really hard-nosed about it, too. So. Yeah, I think an initial handshake with each of the organizations just to figure out what your procedures and what are. I think they, you, you, you figure that out. Um, about the only thing I think that, that might be relevant would be uh, retention requests. Like, we, we are going to uh, be serving you with this, uh, and we would like you to retain the data uh, so that when, you, when we do get the paperwork to you 48 hours from now, like it will still be there. Um, that's probably relevant for you know, for some organizations. I mean, then the, there's that voluntary emergency request where if there is an emergency situation, they can send you this. You you can it, it pretty much says you can voluntarily provide us with this information because it's an emergency, um, and and we go okay, that's good to know, but we are not going to give it to you. Um, and, and, I, and I think a lot of companies have differing policies when it comes down to if there's that imminent harm, you know, it, it's different for Cloudflare because we're not a hosting provider, right? We don't have content or logs of things of who posted this on the site at this, this time. But um, there are like social networks and things where it's like, this person is threatening to commit suicide right now, we need this IP address, we need their address information so we can make sure that they are not going to kill themselves or a bomb threat or some sort of school threat, something like that. Those emergency requests do exist, um, and companies do respond to them with information because they know that legal process is going to follow. Rarely does it not. And in, in, in those situations, there are imminent threat of life or death. And we don't, we don't get those because we don't have that type of content. Uh, so you talked about the, the position of wanting to be as objective as possible always and kind of being as open as possible I suspect and that is essentially the easiest thing to do um, in terms of like your legal position right or you're kind of like how you deal with whether it's human rights or whether it's just privacy or whatever else it is the easiest thing to do is step away from those responsibilities to the degree you can and owning I love the three points and so I guess what I'm curious about is uh, not necessarily with y'all but have you seen any great examples where people do take that next step and say we're an open platform, we try to stay out of this as much as possible, but we also have a view from somewhere, and we are, like, we're pushing this in the right direction, or we're not. Like, they actually have some kind of subjectivity in their, their staffing, or editorial, or whatever you might call it, curation, something that, that uh, allows them to have policies and platform kind of stances that gives them some flexibility, while most, also maintaining mostly open. Most acceptable use policies in terms of service give platforms the ability to make those calls. Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of service providers that will take down phishing sites, that will take down um, you know, hate speech, because they, that's, that's part of their terms of service. They've written it into their terms of service. So there actually, are so, I, so I'm very familiar with those examples. I'm actually talking the other direction. Okay. Like, so things that you do want, um, and kind of pushing more in that direction. Like, is anybody thinking about creating space to like guide <laughs> with as soon as you touch something, right, you actually create liability mm -hmm. on your site. So if you like were to promote something, you create a sense of now we now we're right. looking okay. for it. Yeah. Right. So you happen to be in the business of cultivating activism. Try, try to so right. try and cultivate exactly. activism. So we so definitely take down hate speech, right? Just like, yeah, I guess it can make give more context. But there's also many things that you think are actually very good and you want to see go further. Um, but 
touching them and making sure more of your users might see it or maybe getting it to more people actually also creates liability at the same time. And bias, yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious, have you seen, is there anybody doing it like extraordinarily well that is kind of like, for, for lack of a better term, I know this is incredibly subjective, but like promoting good while mitigating it's bad, right? That is easy, at, like the hate speech line, but then there's a whole other, I should say easy, it's still hard. But like, <laughs> it's not easy. Yeah, definitely not easy. And if, and if the answer is no, that's just interesting too, but I'm just curious. No, okay, so every marketplace that I know of uh, does things to control what kinds of things happen in their marketplace, whether it's Airbnb or Uber or Etsy or Kickstarter, right? And so there's this something that guides the behavior in a certain direction, whether it's a set of standards or inspections or sort of guidelines on, uh, on that. I think you raise an interesting question, like at what point does doing that introduce actual legal liability to the platform? Uh, Andrew might know the answer to that, be being the expert lawyer in the house, but there's you know the Section 230 of the Communication Decency Act, which lets platforms, you know, releases platforms from liability user generated content. But I think right. there are you know limits to that. I'm not aware. You're talking specifically about promoting specific things, promoting good, right? It's more than just yeah. I'm guiding you with our guidelines. We want to try to break this. There's a, there's a certain amount of like I'm going to attract this type of customer because we shape you with our right. terms and our you know. This is type of environment that we've created. You're specifically saying you find something that you like that's good and you promote it. I don't know anybody who's doing that well. <laughs> a lot of market, actually useful answer. A lot of marketplaces do it, but it's yeah. it, you know it's different. It's one thing for Etsy to promote wedding accessories and for you to promote overthrowing the Egyptian government. Right? Well, I mean it's different. Like it's oh June June brides okay, and that's usually like a targeted marketing thing. I mean people do promotion that way in a marketplace, but this is different. This is different. No. You know. I, well, I mean, so I would say like two sort of like marketplaces can do that a lot would be like Reddit does that a lot, right? Which is sort of a content marketplace in some ways, right? So their users do it, but they will often pick a cause that they agree with and promote it in a really big way, right? And Cloudflare, I would say, also did this with Day We Fight Back. Like, they helped us build a, like, map for the campaign. But that's more of a, that's not, that's a specific ex example, right? As part of our sort of general philosophy and activism, it was like, oh, Day We Fight Back, we've, right. you know, there's certain things that we do, but specific to, like, in general, always, this thing? Yeah, so I mean, I think what's interesting to your point is like, we would come out in favor of like open internet or something on behalf of like our company stance on that. But like if a user starts a petition, right, it's like a user generated content that you then want to take further. That's actually like, as soon, to your point, actually section 230 goes away as soon as like, let's say our staff might work with that person to optimize it. Right, that actually, it changes the, the law. Because companies take stances all the time. I mean, there's yeah. lots of letters that come out of CDT where you know we sign in, we go, yep, where we say that this is wrong, or the day we fight back, we participate, we provide an app, and those things like that. Because it's something that Cloudflare as a company is taking a, a, a stance about something, and companies do that all the time. What you're saying about, mm, I don't know. So yeah, I think there's a bunch of questions rolled into one. One is, uh, at what point do curatorial action on a platform impinge on user rights? Yeah. And then there's another one, which is, uh, to what extent are you protected legally from doing things like that, but to do things like that? And then related is, to what extent would those have a brand impact, where you may be legally you know, in the clear, but it puts you in a complicated position in terms of your identity? <coughs> those are all like slightly different questions, but all good ones. If you've ever seen a great example, send it my way. Okay. Um, well, so, oh, yes. Andrew. I mean, I was just kind of like, and for, for a... Oh, and introduce yourself just briefly. I'm Andrew Bridges, just kind of like a For an online service to promote uh, user-generated content, um, as long as it calls attention to it, doesn't edit it, I mean, you were getting at that, I think, with your comment, uh, it's, it's very, very dangerous to mess with the content in any way. Moreover, I'm so paranoid for my clients right now that anything you do to encourage anything on the user-generated content front, if there's any potential copyright violation in connection with that user-generated content, 
you've just put yourself on the hook possibly for thousands. Because copyright millions or billions or trillions of dollars in statutory damages. Right. So. Right, because copyright is the one thing that's carved out of the 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 communications. Yeah. Right. Federal intellectual property right. is carved out in this region, um, but not in all regions. Well, federal intellectual property is carved out everywhere. The question as to what else is carved out uh, in other regions. I can tell you from, from my side of the table, that is extremely difficult to balance with uh, maintaining a usable service free of uh, abuse and spam. Uh, we started to see people using notes within Evernote, publishing them, uh, and using them as basically a spam like URL. Like, go here, and then it talks about some pharmacy in Canada, and then you click on that and you go buy something, and they can post that on, on Facebook because we had a good reputation, and you know, pharmacanada.com does not. Um, and figuring out how to police that in a way that is not involved in inspecting the content of users' accounts, uh, both from a philosophical standpoint that we don't want to be in that business, and also from a legal standpoint that if, if we were to inspect the content of accounts for this purpose, then we would lose protection around uh, on other basis. Um, we, we implemented it as a moderation policy where users would have to report that a particular thing was spam, uh, and then that was the only signal that we would use. We would not look at the content, we would only look at uh, complaints of abuse. And um, uh, that's worked pretty, pretty well. We've been able to do that, although what we found pretty quickly is that uh, children are terrible, terrible people. Uh, because most of the spam reports are for uh, less complaints. Yes, yes. Uh, hashtag children are terrible. Uh, most of the spam reports are for uh, educational materials. You know, this is the syllabus about Harrison Bergeron, and, and you know, children just spam, 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 spam. So uh, we had to we ha have had to uh, fine tune that pretty carefully to make sure that uh, uh, that content moderation uh, was not itself then a means for abuse. Do you have a dispute resolution? Uh, the teacher said, oh, that's... Uh, so, so right now, we're only using it for commercial spam. So uh, if we get a sufficient number of reports, a certain number of IP addresses that are labeled as commercial spam, if we look at it and it contains uh, links or contact information to buy something somewhere else, then, we, then we'll just close that account without um, looking at any other content. Um, but if we are not... We intentionally labeled it report spam. We didn't want to get into, uh, we didn't want to have a, a text box where you could say other things that you don't like about this content because we don't want to, we didn't want to be in the, in the business of having uh, someone typing in that this is a violation of my copyright or, you know, this is, uh, a, this was a picture of me when I was a kid and they, like, we, we didn't want to have a mechanism for uh, that because the, the, the level of discretion that that has to impose on our staff to be able to remedy it is a lot harder than if we're just dealing with uh, commercial redirection. So, like, you were concerned, just, so that was for not for liability reasons, but just for efficiency reasons, your staff didn't have the time to. And, and, and liability, we haven't set policies yet for that. Well, we have official policies for how to deal with all those things, and that's all on our privacy policies in terms of service, but we didn't want our support staff to have to go through you know, unstructured tickets on on a spam reporting thing and have them have to reply to that. So we wanted to go through the formal policy to define exactly what the steps are for someone to do a formal takedown based on the content is uh, one of the big independent process uh, separate from spam tracking, which is needs to be much more responsive because the bad guys just keep opening, opening more and more crap. Uh, Jamie, and then uh, I think we're going to wrap up. So I wanted to make just one final overly broad point. Um, the policies that you set now to protect your customer's data within your environment, whether it's implementing privacy by design, whether it's anonymizing data or minimizing the data that you save, is going to lead you to putting in human rights protections because you never know who's going to use your platform. So if you start off early thinking about user privacy, thinking about protecting and securing your users' data and the way that they access your service, you're going to eventually protect human rights as well. So just something to consider. I think we'll leave it at that. Thank you uh, for all your great questions. This was fun, and uh, we'll be around. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks.